Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Monocatuck Audubon Society, and welcome to this evening's community program, Lights Out Connecticut, The Next Steps. Monocatuck wishes to honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Gusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tocket, Monocatuck, and Hammonasset people as we advocate for the conservation of land and its wildlife we're indebted to the work of native and indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before european colonization before we get going let me just uh give you a few updates uh of upcoming events the urban scapes native plant nursery in new haven is open Saturdays from 9.30 to noon. Our guys have uh, gone back to school, so Tuesdays and Thursdays are no longer options. In two weeks, Wednesday, September 27th, Heather Wolf will, will be doing a presentation, Find More Birds, 111 Surprising Ways to spot birds wherever you are. Her presentation is based on her new book with that title. Saturday, September 30th from one to four, the Bent Fest 30th anniversary at Bend of the River Audubon Center in Southbury. It'll be a fun-filled festival for all ages with live music, live birds of prey, and much, much more. Saturday, October 21st, we have uh, All Things Pollinator at Urbanscapes. That'll run from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll have Highstead um, there with their ecotype plants and mason bee habitat. Xerxes Society will do some pollinator education and, and children ex activities. And you can learn how to identify native plants with your smartphone, and there'll be lots more. So this evening, we're, we're pleased to welcome Craig Rapaz and Meredith um, Barnes. Craig is co-chair of Minnetonka's Lights Out program. And he's been a volunteer coordinator for the Connecticut Bird Atlas. He's president of Friends of Stuart B. McKinney National Wildlife Refuge. He enjoys backpacking and conducts mountain bird watch surveys for the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and that focuses on Bicknell's thrush and other high elevation birds. Meredith is the other co-chair, and she's ju just received her Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School. She, uh, she enjoys finding new ways to support healthy communities through greater care for wildlife in our One Earth home. She helped convince Yale Divinity School to join Lights Out in 2021. She's also a recipient of a LEAP grant from Yale Law School to help make Yale University more bird friendly. And in her spare time, she paints watercolors of birds. Uh, her favorite bird is black throated blue warbler. And with that, let me turn it over to Craig and Meredith. Great, thank you, Dennis. I will start off by sharing our screen. Um, it's been a while since we presented. I think the last time we did present uh, to Mononkatuck, um, we were part of COA. Uh, I'm just happy to say that um, this is a great affiliation to be with Mononkatuck Audubon. I've always felt that your organization has been one of the powerhouses of bird conservation in the state. And so it's a real privilege to be able to work with you. So with that, I will share my screen. Yeah, folks may not know that before there was Lights Out Connecticut, we had 
Lights Out New Haven, and it was Manunkatuck Audubon that was one of our first um, collaborators and supporters. So from the beginning, Manunkatuck Audubon has been with us with this ah. Lights Out effort. That's right. You hosted our website. Okay, I, I know you're a birding organization, so um, let's have a pop quiz. What bird is in our logo? Anybody? <laughs> You're going to unmute not... yourself, Todd. Uh... I'm muted? No. People can unmute themselves if they want to ID the okay. bird. Okay. If you need a hint, it is a warp work. <laughs> Black Burnian? Yes. Yay. <laughs> so everybody gets a sticker. <laughs> Okay, uh, to get started, um, I'm first going to leave you in the dark. So how does it feel to be in the dark? I know you're probably in a lighted room right now, but just try to imagine the, la the last time you were out in the dark. How did you feel? Were you feeling secure? Were you feeling anxious? Were you fe being fearful, uncertain, fearing your toes? Um, this is important as we talk about light pollution because we as humans have evolved to have certain adaptations that other man animals may not have. So for example, it takes humans 15 minutes for pupils to adjust. At the same time, it takes 45 minutes for us to build up a protein pigment called rhodopsin in our eyes. However, once we're acclimated, we can see in the dark as well as rabbits and whippoorwills. However, one flash of light we are back to zero. Furthermore, um, I don't know if you remember the uh, flash photographs that we used to have and that red eye that always shows up in the photographs. Well, that is something that um, <clears throat> is common that you see in other animals like your cat or wolves or foxes that if they have a light, it seems like they're glowing. Um, their, their eyes seem like it glows in the dark. You know, we have this... Um, a tapetum, it's a, it's a membrane that reflects light back out. For humans, it's red. You know, so this occurs in a lot of mammals, birds, spiders, et cetera. It's rather, rather fascinating. Um, but f few of us really um, embrace the dark. These are ancient, well-founded fears. And now, because a lot of our walkways and our streets and our homes are so brightly lit, that just beyond this glare is this darkness that we really don't interact with. And you know, when we do not have this light pollution, this darkness is in degrees in is in degrees of light. So in a dark situation, you know, there could be a sliver of a moon and stars, humans would still be able to see just fine in that once we've adapted. I'm not saying you'd be able to read a book or something, but you, you could actually coexist. That's what our ancestors did. We could do it too. But to get back to where we are um, as humans in the modern age with our with our night sky, uh, these are constellations that are um, kind of starting to disappear over our horizon. This is Scorpio. This is Sagittarius. This is the Milky Way. They're starting to slip away. Some of the planets that we've been enjoying over the summer are starting to get closer to the sun, so we can't see them, and we'll have to wait for them to appear uh, uh, in our morning sky. So who here has ever seen the Milky Way? Who has seen the Milky Way this summer? It used to be a common occurrence to see it. What phase of the moon are we in? My point that I'm trying to make here is that as humans, we can go nights, weeks, months, and years without noticing the night sky. However, if you're a passerine that migrates like a warbler, you don't have the luxury of ignoring the night sky. Ornithologists are still trying to understand how birds navigate during migration in a dark world. Excuse me, I got ahead of myself. Sorry about this. So every spring and fall, these birds migrate at night. They evolved millions of years ago to navigate at night in a dark world to avoid heat and predators. Um, one may ask, well, why do they evolve to do this? Uh, most of our passerines that 
that are going to uh, migrate, they actually evolved in our neotropic region and they took advantage of the larger land mass and the bigger explosion of insects and other food that happened in the Northern hemisphere. And so it was a trade-off that they could have great fecundity with their offspring by migrating. Of course, you know, you always lose some during migration, but they found that they were able to maintain their populations by taking this risk of migration. I think it's also worth noting there that like those birds are migrating from areas that generally don't experience a lot of flight pollution uh, down in the in South America in the rainforest and in the deep forest, and then they're they're migrating up towards the you know the northern boreal forest and the in Canada. Um, some of them are in more lit areas, but basically they're going from ideally a dark environment to again like a dark night sky environment and they're navigating in the midst of that through these very um heavily like polluted areas mm -hmm. so that's a part of the part of like the story of of, uh, yeah. of the migratory birds that that are in our area exactly and they they follow ancient routes they navigate by the stars the moon and earth's magnetic field and also the rising and setting of the sun. The rising sun might signal to birds that it's time to land so they could build energy and rest for a day and take off the next night. I'm sure we've all seen this. Uh, this is put out by National Audubon. This is showing the um, flyways. Just think of this area where we live. I'm gonna refer back to this. So you, you see things get very busy during migration. So as they migrate, it's time to that, we really start to think of the air above us as habitat. Uh, so between these treetops and the mountaintops to the stratosphere, there's a layer cake of air currents, bands of cold and warm air, jet streams, headwinds and tailwinds that are only important to the birds and weather geeks. These layers can both help and hinder migration by giving tailwinds and updrafts, or they could kill birds with strong winds and storms and microbursts. But the birds that migrate, they need a lot of airspace. For waterfowl, it's 200 feet to 4,000 feet. Raptors, 700 to 3,000 feet. And these birds, uh, the, these two groups of birds uh, migrate during the day usually. And it's our songbirds that are migrating at 500 feet to 2,500 feet. One might think, well, they're, they're far above our light pollution. They're far above our windows. What happens? What the real risk is, is when they're landing and taking off in areas where they probably wouldn't be, that's where they risk uh, collisions. We'll go into the mechanisms of, of how light actually um, affects this. What's interesting is you uh, people are birders and lovers of nature. You could experience the, the migration at night um, when the birds eclipse the moon. You, you could count their silhouettes. Um, that's perfect for a September uh, full moon or into October. Sometimes we hear them flying overhead as chirps and other contact calls. And we have built our cities and civilization under their routes. So truly nighttime migration collides with human artificial daylight. So some um, numbers, what does this all mean? Of 722 bird species in North America, 76% of those migrate. Of these, 80% migrate at night. So you can see that there's a huge percentage of our birds that need an, a dark night sky in order to migrate. It is estimated that annually 4 billion birds move south into the contiguous United States every autumn. As you know, uh, if you go birding in Connecticut in the fall or in the spring, you will see birds that are only seen during migration as they are on their way up to breed in Canada. So as they are, uh, these hatch year birds reach um, maturity to be able to fly, you see these numbers reflected um, as 4 billion birds that come into the United States. Oftentimes they're only going into the, this lower tier of the US, uh, but then there are many more that continue on. So there's 4.7 billion birds that leave the United States for the neotropics. And so the reverse trip, is, is uh, in some very diminished numbers. Uh, there's 3.5 billions that cross back into the United States. 
and uh, 2.6 that returning to Canada across the border. So the return rate back to Canada is 64% and the return home to the United States is 76%. Um, this is because of hazards along the migratory routes, the loss of uh, places for the birds to rest during migration, as well as uh, some loss of habitat uh, in their wintering grounds. So during this, and this is a scary number, we lose up to 1 billion birds to light pollution related uh, window collisions every year in the United States. That's up to 1 billion birds. Um, how do we know this? How do we track this? Um, you may be familiar with how Doppler radar works. Uh, it is set at a certain elevation and as the flock of birds that take off from an area, uh, first they show up as a dot and then they start to expand out and then to a cloud. So this um, technology is the basis for this wonderful um, website uh, called BirdCast that's put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, it was, I think Meredith, you posted this today that this is going to be a big flight night over Connecticut. That's um, right. You can see they're using radar to determine that. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can see where that concentration is. It's a little bit south of us, but you can see um, along where New York and Connecticut is, we're still in the medium to high with an estimated 333 million birds. Which is like so get your binoculars ready. Yeah. So, but there are not just birds. Um, there are many other nocturnal species with an evolution story that depend on the dark. You know, we, we have fish, bats, sea turtles, amphibians, and insects um, th that rely on dark in order to continue their life cycle, their life cycles. But back to humans. Um, although we do have some adaptations to live in the dark, we really they are daytime animals, and we have tr always tried to light the night with fires and torches. So since 1807, when gas street lamps were first introduced, man has continued to push back the night. At, as time moved on, we would develop incandescent lighting and later the bright halogens and now the LEDs that we're now using. I'm sure we all have a neighbor that has their place lit up like this. None of us do, right? So our future looked bright, or there was a lot of brightness in our future. However, there's a price that's being paid by wildlife and, and humans. So, so we use the light to sell our products and shine on our accomplishments. There seems to be a lot more um, light pollution in areas that are more affluent or these uh, bigger business centers. And we're using these blue, white, LEDs to, to light us up. Um, so this will create this sky glow over our towns and our cities. To make matters worse, we have reached upward into the, these layers I was talking about in the air uh, that has reached through our, our sky glow. These are beams from towers, airports, and monuments that emanate out of that sky glow and, hail, uh, and will halo our sprawling megalopolis. So what is the end result? Remember that map I asked you to, to, to remember? So this, as you could tell, is Long Island Sound. It is highlighted uh, by the lights. This is 95 and this is the 91 corridor. Of course, it's Long Island, this is New York. So th this is what the birds have to migrate through. And I like to point out that every one of these lights is a decision that somebody has made that they need a light there that will glow up into the atmosphere this way. And so it's very important that we're able to change minds that there could be better ways of um, keeping us safe and existing in this world. Um, we draw a lot of our information from International Dark Sky Association, which was started by um, astronomers. Uh, there are much, much more than that now, but um, we could draw on, ast on astronomy to really understand the issue of light pollution and how bad it is. There's this um, scale to measure the um, clarity or the light pollution of the night sky called the Bortle scale. Uh, one, I don't know how many of us have actually been in an excellent dark sky site. Um, I know there's one down in Texas, the Big Bend 
National Park. I was in one up in Maine. Um, they're becoming uh, huge uh, attractions for tourists who just want to experience dark and night sky and um, northern lights and um, the Milky Way and all of this. However, most of us are living in an inner city or a suburban area, and we do not see some of these finer um, stars, which is too bad. Some of these stars, the light was emanated back when dinosaurs roamed our planet. And it's just reaching us now, and we can't see it. So the light pollution really is robbing us from the po the poetry of the universe. So let's talk about how this light pollution actually uh, impacts birds. They can mistake our lights to be stars. Uh, there was a very fascinating study that was done showing uh, birds in a planetarium where they saw pol um, the North Star Polaris, and it was um, the planetarium was set to rotate as it normally would, as if it were true stars going around the uh, the North Pole, and they would try to fly north during the fall migration. They are just able to know where North is by watching this movement, this rotation. So the experimenters changed the North Star. They chose Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion. It's one of his shoulders. And they reoriented themselves to um, that other false North. So they are able to sense where North is by the stars. So if they can't see the stars, they're going to be disoriented. Furthermore, if there is the uh, a rising sun, oh, oh, excuse me, if there's a city with sky glow, they can mistaken it for a rising sun. Uh, for whatever reason, it's not clearly understood that the birds will get caught in some of these bright areas and circle and circle and circle. Now, the issue is that they may not collide into the building at that moment. They might go crashing down into city parks and our rural areas um, to rest. And sometimes they're so exhausted, they've depleted their energy stores, this, this fat that they uh, carry uh, in their upper chest. So they depleted this and, and they come crashing down in these areas where they wouldn't normally be. And they are then exposed to our buildings, they're exposed to glass that reflect the landscape and the result is catastrophic. Uh, just one building can cause major problems for birds in an area. Within one week in 2017, nearly 400 passerines were caught in the floodlights of a 32-story Texas skyscraper and killed by window collisions. Meredith, I know you have written about similar incidences in New York and Philadelphia. Yeah, probably one of the more uh, famous mass mortality events. I mean, these are happening at a, at a kind of a smaller scale, like one or two birds per building is kind of the norm. But then when we have these mass collision events where, like you just mentioned, 400 birds in one night or um, in uh, September, on September 14th, 2021, about 300 to 500 birds collided into the New York City World Trade Center, the new, the new building there, and were killed um, because of some weather conditions that made the um, lights reflect off the clouds. And we also had a mass mortality event actually in New Haven this past fall where something like 70 to 80 dark-eyed gemfos crashed into a building here at Yale University. That was documented by Christoph Zyskowski, who's um, a resident uh, ornithology expert at, uh, at the Peabody Museum. So you have these mass mortality events that kind of bring the problem into sharp relief, but really the it's more like a slow bleed of, the, of how we get to that one billion number is like one or two birds per building over a series of days, that these mass mortality events are very shocking and tragic. Thank you. I'm sure we're all aware of this uh, shocking study that came out in the journal Science in October 2019, that uh, since 1970, we have lost uh, 3 billion birds in North America. That's one in four of our birds are gone. And many of these birds are facing extinction. And um, you just have to, to read the, the reports and the accounts. And so, you know, these, these birds, once they're extinct, they're just going to leave a ghost in our memory. 
Um, and I just need to interject here. It's been a, a long time that I've been in New Haven and been involved in conservation issues with birds, working in New Haven uh, Bird Club and with the Connecticut Ornithological Association. And there's some really serious threats uh, for our birds, rising sea levels, climate change, habitat loss, forest fragmentation, um, the list goes on and on. But when it comes to uh, light pollution and collisions, it's a very easy fix. You just shut off your lights and you make your windows visible to birds. So let's review those numbers again. 722 species in North America, 76% migrate, 80% of those migrate at night, and up to 1 billion birds every year are, are lost. Half of these are lost in our own homes. I know we like to, to blame the big bad buildings in our cities, but half of these are occurring in our residents uh, because of window crashes and windows uh, that overlook patios, et cetera. Um, and we could get into the histories of what's happening with these other animals. For example, moss, very important to birds, very important to our plants. Be um, they are the main source of caterpillars that the birds, uh, that our, our migrants depend on uh, in the spring to be able to uh, lay their eggs and, and feed their young. Uh, there's what's called the vacuum cleaner effect. The, the moths are, are attracted to lights and they'll spend the entire night uh, flying around tighter and tighter circles until they're, they're lost and killed in the light or are exhausted. So every night that these moths are spending like this, they're not eating and they're not mating. So if you talk about one light, it could be a street lamp, could be a house, but then you have a whole string of them. The moths we're trying to get from one habitat lot to another are going to get sucked up in this and lost. So you could have a region that could actually have zero success rate in its breeding cycle for a whole host of moths. Um, the, the fish, for also for example, I'll get into that in the next slide. Um, this summer, I'm starting to see fireflies. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we're not seeing fireflies. Um, people who are putting down insecticides or cleaning up their yard, so it looks like a shag green carpet, uh, one of the big reasons. But once you stop using insecticides, you leave certain parts of your yard alone to let the leaf litter there. Um, and shut off your lights, the fireflies come back. One thing that happens is if there's a huge floodlight out onto your backyard, the fireflies don't know if it's really night. Do they Should they start to shine? If they do shine, then the females can't find them. This is the male that's shining here, and it's, a, it's an interaction. Uh, they do this to attract mates. There's a lot of stories. That I'm sure you've heard about turtles. Uh, the spotted salamander um, needs to have very dark skies in the spring to find these vernal pools to mate and, and lay their eggs. Uh, one of the big issues, very serious as far as our aquatic areas, are the zooplankton. Uh, this is um, a lot of different types of crustaceans or um, um, uh, non-vertebrates that will actually live in the lower part of the water column. But what happens they stay down there so they won't be predated. And at night, that's when they come up to feed more. However, if there's a lot of light pollution, they don't know if it's day or night and they stay down. So they could lose an entire evening of feeding uh, because of light pollution. And there was a 2020 study in Plymouth, England that showed that uh, because of the lighting along their coast, that up to 60% of the seafloor in their survey region was exposed to artificial light. This is having a serious impact on uh, this marine life there. And this is true in our rivers, it's true in our ponds and lakes. So people with a nice lake house and they have a huge um, light on their dock, this is a huge disservice to the marine life there. So I don't know how many people have experienced this, a very bright shining light that might come into your, um, in, through your window and impact you. This is called light trespass. I know in Hamden, Connecticut, it's actually against the town ordinance to, to create this, but enforcement is a different issue. Um, so in light pollution, in addition to impacting birds, also impacts human health. 
causing stress and insomnia. Artificial night lighting has dramatically disturb disturbed our circadian rhythms, most notably our sleep. In turn, many people are chronically sleep deprived, which contributes to mood disorders, depression, reduced cognitive efficiency, and learning. Disrupted circadian rhythms associated with artificial night lighting have been strongly linked to impaired metabolic function, obesity, and various types of cancer, especially those are, that are endocrine related. Melatonin, this is the root cause for all this. Uh, melatonin is a powerful antioxidant and it helps us induce sleep, boosts the immune system, lowers cholesterol, and helps the functioning of the thyroid, pancreas, ovaries, testes, adrenals, etc. So in, 19, uh, in 2012, the American Medical Association actually declared light pollution at night to be carcinogenic. To shock you even further, in 2008, there was a study in Israel of women living in neighborhoods where the light was light enough for them to actually read. And they found that there was a 73% higher risk of developing breast cancer in that population. This is because of outdoor artificial light. Um, a lot of people say, but we need to be safe at night. Um, the, yeah, I understand where people are coming from. However, there is no science to back that up. There's no clear evidence that increased outdoor lighting deters crime. It may make us feel safe, but it's not shown to make us safer. There's a 2015 study that was published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, where 62 municipalities in England and Wales I had found that there is zero impact on safety, either crime or accidents because of lighting. It had no, the lighting had no effect, whether they turned them off completely, dim them, turn them off at certain hours or substituted low power LEDs. So the, the truth of the matter is most property crime occurs in the light of the day. And some crimes like vandalism and graffiti actually thrive on night lighting. You're actually lighting up the criminal's workspace, and they thank you very much. So this might, point there. yeah, go ahead if you're Meredith. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna add in there is that um, the really the movement with lights out and also the dark sky is to turn off unnecessary or non-essential lights. So when lighting is needed for, you know, occupational purposes or professional work, or if it is needed for security reasons, then there is a reason to have the light and there should be there. But what we're really trying to address, and I hope that that's clear in what Craig is saying and what um, and what the science is saying is that we're having just a lot of unnecessary light. And that's the light that's not needed, you know, for security reasons. We do sometimes need it. The point is not to turn off all lights, but to turn off the unnecessary lights and to really use some discernment there, deciding like what light do we need and which lights are more decorative or, you know, we think are look pretty or think we're safer, but which ones actually do we need is really the, the question. Right. Yeah, Meredith shared with me uh, something from the Canadian uh, Lights Out organization that it's not a question of more light, but just better light. Um, so you probably recognize this. This is New Haven Harbor. It looks all beautiful with this polarized light and filter that this photographer used. Um, I was talking to a friend, Chris Howe. She's a president of New Haven Bird Club. She's also with the Coast Guard Auxiliary Long Island Sector Coordinator. She teaches a lot of navigation. And she was saying that in these lights, what happens is these um, lights that light up the navigation channels, like uh, I guess on your left side, the port side is red. These uh, mariners can't really see these lights because of the light pollution in the background. So this is really, in, it impacts the way we're driving because of the glare that we can get. It's also uh, impacting our nautical traffic. So what can you do? Um, you can switch off your lights uh, from 11 to 6 during peak migration, April 1st to May 31st, and now August 15th to November 15th. I know on Facebook there was this uh, poster going around that came out from um, an, an aviary out in Utah, and they were talking about just doing it until October 6th. They're in Utah. I guess things are different there. Please. Uh, keep following this rule of thumb until November 15th. 
you could uh, take our pledge and join Lights Out Connecticut. Um, go onto our website, um, fill this out, um, uh, and we could uh, keep you on our e email list to keep you apprised of what's going on. So other things that you could take at your house. Um, this was something that was just recently built for us. Uh, it's a display that when we have in-person uh, meetings, this is what we'll show. This is the bad guy. This is the floodlight that people use, and this is extremely bright. It's as bright as the sun if you look at it. Um, motion sensor is nice, but this is just going to light up the neighborhood. But if you're able to shield it so it's only on the ground, that's that's even better. This shows the shielding that you can do. Uh, notice that you can't see the light at all, but the light is shining where you need it, like Meredith said. We're not like totally no light whatsoever. Just put it where you need it and when you need it. And this is a more modern version of your grandparents' old bug light on the back porch. Uh, this is going at about, um, it's a, more of an amber light. Um, this, some, li some lighting goes on this scale of Kelvin. Uh, so this is the, the really bright lights that are the huge problem are up to 27,000 Kelvin. We want to get people down around 2,700 Kelvin, a big difference. So further talk about lights, this is something near and dear to our hearts because 9-11 was this past week. Uh, there was a monument that they light up uh, once a year. And when they first started doing this, uh, it was noted that a lot of birds were caught swarming around the beacon. And New York City Audubon started uh, monitoring these birds, found that they were, some of them were dropping out of the sky. They were disoriented, would fly in circles. So what they do now, working with New York City Audubon personnel, is they would monitor uh, the density of the birds around the beacon, and then it, when it gets to a certain limit, they will shut off the monument for 20 to 30 minutes. And that is enough time for the birds to reorient themselves and continue on their way on their migration. Yeah, it's called the Tribute in Light. Actually, we flew, flew through New York yesterday, which was September 12th, and the lights were still shining from the 9-11. Um, they're still up? Okay, I was on yeah, the Yeah, they were still uh, shining last night when I flew in uh, late last night. Um, but those Tribute in Lights um, help us to understand um, the kind of effect of the light pollution on the birds, that they get attracted to the light, and then they get caught in the light, and they're really circling and um, unable to break out of it. So they, they turn it off briefly. So so they're trying to, yeah, that's Amy Hopkins seeing that note, is that they're trying to find a balance there of like giving a tribute to the people. And then when it's too much for the birds, then they, they turn off the lights and they let the, the birds pass through. And they're closely monitoring that with New York City Audubon as a partner now. Thank you. Also, another important study is, um, this is McCormick Place. It's a Lakeside Center in Chicago. Uh, there's been a lot of research, a lot of interior uh, lighting, a lot of uh, glass that reflects, and they found that this could be a bird killer. But they found if they shut off 50% of their lights, that they will reduce collision mortality by up to 60%. So that's encouraging. It's not linear. You get more bang for your buck. Uh, the, the things you can do, like I pointed out, half of the bird mortalities are occurring in our homes. So please do something about your windows using decals. Uh, I know, Dennis, you uh, gave a presentation to Minunkatuck, um sometime last year that covered this, uh, using tempura paint or hanging cords, screens, etc. cetera. Um, one thing I think uh, Meredith is going to go into later is the, the bird treatment for commercial buildings and how they are actually coming down in price. Um, this is Evans Hall. Uh, they agreed to treat a certain area that nobody can see uh, with uh, a type of etching. So from a distance, you can't see it. Close up, you could hardly see it. And really close up, uh, you only see it in the, uh, the sky areas. So... I'm sorry, go ahead. Backstory with that, with the Evans Hall, that's at the at Yale University. It's their school of management building. It's well known in the bird community as a bird killer. It kills a few hundred birds each year. Um, 
about three to 400 birds each year. And they agreed um, last fall to treat just a small portion of the back that, uh, that Craig was just showing and explaining that they put this, this is called the feather friendly film, feather friendly film, which is just square decals. And um, the report that they are, are gonna be publishing soon is that bird mortalities at the location that was treated, that was mitigated, fell to zero. So they got no more collisions once they put up the feather friendly film. The other sad piece of news there is that um, they get quite a few birds, including one of the first big male thrushes to be spotted in New Haven since 1975 was uh, found there struck against that building. So that building um, that they're working with them to find a, sort of a longer term solution for the rest of the building just continues to kill birds. So we were billed as what are we going to do um, uh, in the upcoming years? So we're going to lights out Connecticut. We'll continue to organize the past meaningful legislation to protect birds in the night sky. We were very busy this past legislative session, but uh, more on that later. Uh, we'll help focus efforts on homeowners, business owners, towns and cities and state governments. We'll share our resources like pamphlets and model leg legislation and ordinances. So please check out our website. There's a lot there. And there's going to be more, even more in the coming months. Host an event, make presentations, and support bird strike monitoring and data collection. And we're going to continue to lobby. So what can you do? You could join us. You could take the Lights Out Pledge, as I mentioned. You could think of ways to launch an initiative in your town to improve lighting rules, and you could collect bird strike data, and you could advocate, just advocate for birds in the night sky. And so when I say advocate, I don't mean that you need to storm the Bastille. I don't mean you need to fight, square off with the uh, British army on a bridge in Massachusetts, um, but there's ways to advocate. And I wanna to turn this over to Meredith now to kind of take us through this uh, very important study of uh, it's a compilation of what other cities and, and municipalities have done. She pen, uh, wrote this with Vivica, who is on our steering committee. And this is a really a very, very important uh, piece of work. So, Meredith. Yeah, so um, Yale University has um, a program called the Yale Bird Friendly Building Initiative. Um, it's an ongoing, they just, we got a first grant last year. There's a second grant. Uh, again, this year to continue with both bird monitoring um, on site at the university to um, figure out which buildings are killing birds and then advocating to mitigate those. And that's actually going very well there. They, I think they've already mitigated two or three buildings, including on the West Campus. And then the other part of the initiative is to study policies. Um, and I was part of the policy research. So Vivica and I um, wrote this report. It's called Building Safer Cities for Birds how cities are leading the way on bird friendly building policy. Um, it was co-published by the American Bird Conservancy and then Yale Law School through the Law, Ethics, and Animal Program. And uh, what this what this uh, report is, is five case studies of five different policies. Four of them are laws or local ordinances passed by cities. So San Francisco was the first 2011. We have Madison, Wisconsin, which is the first uh, law to face a legal challenge because of that state being a purple state. It was challenged by a conservative law firm, uh, the Will um, Law Firm, and it survived the legal challenge so far. We have uh, Cupertino, California, um, Arlington, Virginia, which is one of the few that doesn't have a full law. It has a, an, a, an incentive program to incentivize building or building owners to follow bird friendly law. And then we have New York City, which of the five laws that we study is just really the, the best of the laws. And at the time when we wrote it, it was the best law. Now, I think it's um, Washington DC has the best law. So it's five case studies, and then kind of like an overview of, of um, how cities are leading the way um, in the absence of federal law and oftentimes state laws that these cities are actually requiring mostly all new construction and then also major uh, renovations of buildings that they are required um, to to use bird friendly building materials which is glass and then also in most cases in like 80 percent of cases is to um, also uh, do uh, have a lighting component because 
from the very beginning when San Francisco passed the first bird friendly building law in 2011, um, the two twin problems of glass, of the collisions, and then also the lighting have been addressed together in this, in the legislation. So um, almost all the laws have a, have a glass component, like glass regulations, and then lighting. Uh, next slide. So the cities are really passing comprehensive um, and effective rules. Um, they're getting better and better. We finally have a law now that matches the, um, that's free on the website, on the American Bird Conservancy website. So we can, we can drop the link to the uh, report. The report's available and it has a very handy appendix, which is a table of, um, I think, more than two dozen laws uh, you know, across, across the United States. And this is a U.S. study. So these are all U.S. cities and also states. So um, the city level Yes, rules... Dennis posted the link in the comments. So it's there for people to grab. Oh, good. Thanks, Dennis. So um, what we were able to find with our policy, because we, we spoke with um, city officials, policymakers, glass manufacturers, architects, uh, many, many bird advocates. We talked to all the different Audubon uh, representatives. Uh, we also talked to some um, um, consumer, you know, uh, chambers of commerce. And what we found surprisingly was that these cities, including Arlington, are passing these laws with no additional cost to the cities. In most cases, um, they compared it to like the ADA, the American Disabilities Act rules, where it's just um, here are the new rules that we have to follow. So when when building project developers present a plan, they just look through, does it tick the boxes of what's required? So the bird friendly just adds another one or two checks to there. So there, these cities, New York City, you know, San Francisco, Arlington, they are, they are able to um, protect the birds in their legislation without any cost to the city. Um, we also found that city ordinances help to inspire other city ordinances. So like San Francisco inspired something like eight or nine cities right around the Bay Area. They've got Cupertino, they've got Oakland, Berkeley just passed one this, just a couple of months ago. Um, there's about eight or nine cities right around San Francisco that have them. And we think that there's gonna be kind of like an, a, a growing trend that um, these more progressive and environmentally minded cities are gonna um, look to each other to follow these new rules um, around glass. And the thing about it is that they're finding that um, a lot of times with the requirement to make the glass, glass elements that could be like windows, um, doors, entire curtains or walls of curtains, even like on people's porches, they might have like a piece of glass that's on their porch. That's an architectural feature that can create a hazard for birds. Um, there are simple things that they can do to treat the glass, but even something as simple as an insect screen. An insect screen is a low cost, low technology solution that the American Bird Conservancy recognizes as a way if it's exterior, if the insect screen is exterior. And so a lot of new construction in New York City, they're gonna start putting um, insect screens on the exterior and then that will uh, create that visual so that birds can see the, so the, see the glass. So it doesn't have to be an expensive um, thing to follow the rules. Um, and then we're also finding that the bird-friendly building laws are driving innovation and then decreasing the cost because some of the glass is expensive, more expensive than standard glass, especially UV treated. And um, as more and more manufacturers are required to use that material, of course, like uh, with as the uh, supply goes up, then the cost goes down. And we already saw that from the people at Walker Glass who spoke to us with our research is that with their expanding markets with the demand is that the, the costs of the uh, bird friendly glass are, is coming down. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And um, yeah, the few of the other takeaways are that um, Oftentimes, we saw this in city after city, is that it oftentimes only took one person to ask, what are you doing for the birds? That's literally how the entire um, 
city ordinance in Madison and even the state level rule that, that Wisconsin passed that requires um, all new state owned buildings to follow bird friendly laws. It required one person at a um, city council meeting to ask, oh, you're building all these glassy buildings near the lakes here because they have many lakes in Madison. And they said, well, what are you doing for the birds? And they, it wasn't on their radar. They didn't even know it was a problem. And then that kicked off the University of Wisconsin-Madison doing their own research and then funding a conference and then University of Wisconsin-Madison started to mitigate their building. Uh, basically, um, it can really one person or a few well-pointed people can really kick off the whole um, movement. Um, also, uh, goes well with timing is if you have local officials who, who are sympathetic. Um, and that what we found over and over again is that you don't have to have local local um, bird strike data in order to pass a law. They did not have that in Cupertino. They didn't have it in San Francisco. Um, you only have to have the larger scale national um, studies that show that birds die due to collisions and that um, that the bird populations are in decline. And oftentimes that science journal article that Craig um, cited before that's called the declines in North American avian fauna, that 2019 article um, that came out in the science journal and that was published, yeah, that got a lot of attention, that was enough to convince um, a lot of city officials that there's a problem and that they have a role to play, that they have a um, real obligation to respond. So local bird strike data is not necessarily important to pass a law. And then also, just as a final piece, is that there's a real synergy between bird-friendly building uh, regulations and like you know decreasing lighting and um, using less glass and green buildings policy. So green building regulations is uh, better insulated buildings, so like less glass and then less lighting. They usually have a timer that goes off at 12 o'clock in most green buildings. You know, I'm talking energy efficient buildings. They have those timers and motion sensors, as you'll notice. Like you'll go into a, a restaurant bathroom and suddenly the bathroom light will come on. So green building solutions and bird friendly building solutions are very synergistic and overlapping. So if you can convince people to go with the green building, um, they can also go bird friendly. They're, those things are really, um, you know, uh, uh, one in the same. Um, next slide, please, Craig. I think that might be it for the sec section. So I think maybe we won't go into too much detail because it's there's just a lot of information on it. I just will refer you to the report, but because um, the report really is meant for you know lay people. So if you want to get a deeper dive into it, just read that first introductory section. But the point, the main takeaway is that cities have a really important role to play in protecting birds. And a lot of times people on city council, they care about birds, they care about biodiversity, they care about the green building and decreasing energy use and saving money. So uh, there's all reasons why a bird friendly building uh, rule could um, be passed locally. Yeah, these are the two main reasons why, those are the excuses that are usually given of why they can't do it, it's because of the cost, but the cost is the same for a friendly building and regular building is the same. If you plan it from the beginning, you can make a building that's bird friendly at the exact same cost as a regular building. And then the aesthetics um, that really, you know, adding an insect screen or doing some um, glass mitigation or less lighting doesn't affect the aesthetics of the building. So. They're really like not. They're really non reasons. Um, if they're done correctly, then cost and aesthetics are definitely not an issue. We also found because there's some beautiful, absolutely gorgeous bird friendly buildings, absolutely beautiful ones as um, that were on the slide before. Like the Brooklyn Botanical Garden is uh, bird friendly, has um, mitigation on the glass, and it's an absolutely beautiful award winning building. So. I think that might be it, Craig. Um. We'll take our victory lap. Yeah, you take that one. <laughs> um, I'm sure it, a lot of you were uh, hearing from us the past couple of months into our uh, spring. Um, 
about HB 6607 that later became Act 14323, which was the uh, Lights Out Law, which was, uh, to recap, it was requiring all state-owned buildings to shut their lights off from 11 till 6 in um, the, the time period that we asked for. However, we were just asking for um, during peak migration, but because of their assessment, realized that they were saving taxpayers millions of dollars. So they made this year round. Um, this was like a really great experience for us um, because we got to reach out to a lot of people throughout the state. Um, people in the state, we really got to see how um, important they are as far as really trying to make uh, an impression, reaching out to their senators and legislatures in Hartford. So um, it's a victory lap that I think everybody um, should take. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, it, this bill passed unanimously out of committee, out of the House, and unanimously out of the Senate. So uh, it's quite a victory. Um, we don't think it goes far enough, and we will be spending some time to uh, have some uh, further and definitions put on it and other uh, parts of it. Um, we're kind of running over here. So um, just to get to how you could actually uh, report, I know somebody said that they are using a, a different type of um, reporting, uh, but DBIRD was started by somebody from New York City Audubon. It's not an app, it's web-based. You could go on, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you're using it on your cell phone, it'll just use your GPS feature. You um, identify the bird if you can, anything you know about it, uh, how it died, where you found it, et cetera. And then uh, upload an image and hit submit. And then it goes to a database that um, people who are studying this or need the data can, can uh, use. So um, once again, uh, hats off to Manakatak Audubon, our parent organization, and a lot of these other organizations that are, that are supporting us. And at this point, um, what are your questions? And I'll stop sharing the screen. So uh, thank some you, uh, Craig out, and uh, Dev Gerritsen. Uh, in your comments, you said that you were able to call UI about a shielding issue of the street lamps, and they responded, which is really good. Amy Hopkins mentioned an issue with Jordan's furniture. I know exactly what you mean, that place is lit up. Yeah. Uh, even some of these storage areas are pretty it should bad. It's against the law, actually. I mean, the light trespass onto I-95 there, it's actually dangerous. I find it like it's really dangerous driving by there. I'm sure if someone measured the light trust house, they would be, you know, violating the local ordinance. Both Jordan and a lot of those um, self-storage, like U-Haul and, you know, those self-box, those buildings are so overlit. Um, and for whatever reason, there's just no enforcement there. It's, it's really a question of enforcement and compliance, and that requires a lot of uh, just complaints. It's a matter of, of neighbors complaining and the public complaining. That's how um, lighting rules are um, actually enforced, is only through complaints. Thank you. And Amy uh, Hill mentioned, uh, well, she asked what uh, the what is on our website. Um, yeah, we, we need to add, add a lot more material and the list of what you can do, um, that slide will definitely show up. Also, um, Madeline Raleigh, who is on the call tonight, she is somebody in Bridgeport who is starting to organize people down there. And uh, I've been working with Madeline to get a meeting happening. Uh, this is the stage where we are, where we want to take this to uh, the cities and towns and support um, people who are able to champion this cause and start talking to the town councils. But she asked what Connecticut municipalities are getting involved. I've heard that there, uh, I was just at the Hartford Audubon last night, and it looks like people are anxious to get going in West Hartford and Hartford in um, Montville. Um, I gave a presentation there. Some, some people want to take things over. Um, let's see, where are Essex, uh, Guilford. Greenwich, did you say Greenwich? Very strong movement in Greenwich uh, that they've act, they're talking with their town council. Mm -hmm. uh, some stuff that happened in Westport and Southport. Canton. So 
the, the coming on board. Yeah, because when um, we first launched this was last, we first launched Lights Out Connecticut was not this February, but February before. And that summer, um, me and Craig were kind of like, well, where is everybody? Where, where are our local people who are going to start <laughs> uh, working alongside us? But it took a little bit of time and it took, I think, also the passage of that state level rule, you know, the uh, public act number 23143. And then now is really like the towns. And I think as, as we saw in the policy report was that cities inspire each other and they look to each other for model laws and things. So I think that's what will again happen is that your neighbor, you know, if Handon has one and then New Haven can do it or, uh, you know, Southboro, and then you can kind of get um, inspired by a local um, neighbor city that, that passes an ordinance. So hopefully they'll start to spark off and then we can get a lot of these cities going and um, and start to build kind of a real movement here in Connecticut. Meredith, don't mute yourself yet. You should feel this next one from Lindsay Carpenter. Um, she asks, are there any residential building codes for new construction and lighting in the works? Yeah, well, that is in the works because um, so that act that Craig just talked about, it's it's public act number 23-143. And um, there's a component that requires all state-owned buildings to dim their lights, but there's also a piece, which is like part three of that law, which is that the state has to review the building code for state-owned buildings. So that would all be all new construction. And I don't know if it would cover all major renovations, but excuse me, that's how most capital building projects is that once they cross a certain certain threshold of, you know, how many millions of dollars. So um, we're going to be working closely with the people at the Dark Sky Connecticut chapter, uh, Leo Smith, who's also on our, um, on our, on our uh, steering committee. And so we're going to be looking at how can we improve that. And Dennis is a is sorry, not Dennis. Uh, Leo really looks at the lighting component, but we can also at that time raise the problem of the glass. It was also raised when we were giving our testimony in Hartford. Of they were saying, well, maybe we should add glass to this law. They were considering it at one point. You know, they they liked the fact that the lighting affected the birds. We said, but what about the glass? So there might be room for us to also put something in there for again, this is state-owned building. So that state-owned buildings, all new construction would have to have the um, bird-friendly uh, glass as well. Bird-friendly, because that's actually what the state of Wisconsin has, inspired by their uh, Madison city-level laws that all new uh, capital projects in Wisconsin have to follow bird-friendly building that's, um, that's glass. So it's something that's being done at other states. Uh, Maryland has it, Illinois. So we, we would definitely be um, in good company if we were able to get a bird from building more comprehensive that regulates glass and lighting. There's also a bird safe building bill that's been stuck in Congress for years, a national bill. Um, that would, oh, U.S. Uh, bill, yes. That's true, yep. Um, yeah, the House. Yeah, I think. So let's see, uh, Karen Seligson asks uh, if we could state, if we could post these stats on our website, we both certainly will. Uh, um, one thing I wanna ask Dennis, I know you've recorded this meeting. Uh, is it possible that we get a link and we could post that on our website? Yes. So people could have this presentation. So yes. yeah, we're gonna be adding a lot more to the website uh, that's going to help you with your converse, conversations that you have with your friends and hopefully, reaching out to people on your so, uh, select board and council. Because um, it's kind of like a two, I would say there's like kind of a three-step process, which is, I don't know what, what towns or cities all of you are from. I know we have Madeline who's from Bridgeport, but like if first step is to look at your local lighting rules. That's the first step because people were surprised when I was in Canton, I was doing a presentation at the local public library and I, like, I said, well, let's look at your rules. And they were actually really good rules. There was no light, you know, firm, firm position, no light trespass. You can't shine light on your neighbor's lawn. You can't have, uh, you know, decorative lighting most of the year, except during Christmas time, you can have holiday lighting. Otherwise, no decorative lighting. They had really good rules, but they were not being enforced. So the first thing is to look at your local law to like kind of study them. 
and then consider how could these be improved? Because sometimes there's like a little bit of room for improvement or a lot of room. And then you can talk to your, to your city officials. And then the third piece is how do we make this enforceable? How can we get compliance with the rules? Because you could have the best law in the world and if it's not being followed or enforced, then it doesn't matter. So you might be surprised when you go to look at your, you know, look at your city or town uh, code and then building code, look at your lighting rules, see how you could maybe improve them. And um, you could you can ask or consult with us if you want to look at your law together and then and then to figure out how to make it enforceable. There's different that strategies would, for that. Could I ask? Uh, uh, Lindsay, you just, mentioned uh, um, put the, put the, it to uh, wetlands. Excuse me, Craig. Just I was going to suggest that everybody put their town in the chat so we'd have an idea of oh, where people are from. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we'd love great. to hear that. Uh, so, so Lindsay, um, you mentioned uh, an issue uh, with people shining lights into wetlands. This is very, this is an issue that just came up. I'm on the um, Hamden Land Trust, and somebody had their home broken into, and they're telling us he's going to install floodlights in this backyard that's going to shine into this pond that is a property of the land trust, and that's there protected for insects. And amphibians. Um, so in Hamden, there's a law that you cannot have light trespass. So what he's proposing is actually against the law, and we will take it up with this person. So in order to find your local codes in your towns, it's not easy. I had a hard time finding this in, in Hamden. Fortunately, a friend of mine knew right where to go. Um, so be patient. You might have to go through online pages and pages and pages of these co codes in order to find out if they have anything uh, on, on the books to protect against the light trespass and light pollution. And if there is, you have to ask, how is it enforced? Um, so that's another issue. So yeah, if there is a light trespass law on the books, then that simply means that the light cannot go beyond their property. So it cannot shine into a protected wetland. Uh, Janet, hi. Um, Janet Ainsworth. Janet, did I meet you at an AMC event this past uh, winter? Quite possibly. Was it uh, the annual meeting in... Norwood Mass, perhaps, or the annual meeting in uh, Eastern Connecticut for the chapter. I I have a stack. I'll follow Carl. I'll follow up with you to get you some literature. Thank you very much. Yes. Almost every town or city should have their lighting code. If you can find your town or city code and then you just kind of like look within that for lighting, there almost always is a lighting uh, code. Um, it just might take a little bit of video. The thing is, is that it keeps getting in the news. I mean, it's almost every, every it's like at least two or three times a week that somebody sends us an article uh, there was just something on CBS. The Smithsonian right now has an entire uh, ex exhibit on light pollution. So this is a conversation I think that we're going to keep hearing about, you know, with um, this COP20, um, the biodiversity, um, you know, uh, conference that they had in Montreal um, this over this past winter is like, how do we address the declining species, the by declining biodiversity and light pollution is going to become a larger and larger topic. Um, I think, you know, every single week we get a new study or something about LEDs or light pollution's effects on human health or the, the planet. So this, the time is really ripe for this conversation. I think that you'll find people are receptive to it because they experience it personally and they don't want the harms that it's causing. So um, I hope that as you start these conversations uh, with friends and, you know, in your church or in your schools or 
in all your different circles that you'll find um, allies pretty quickly. I hope that you will. People who love birds or who love butterflies or, you know, pollinators. So I think I think it's a conversation that's needed and that people realize it's needed. So I So are there other questions, comments? Oh, thanks again for your support. Um, I'm finding the Nutcatuck to be a pleasure to work with and you know, always happy to, to come back and report our progress and how things are going. Well, thank you, uh, Craig and Meredith. Uh, sparked a lot of interest here and uh, Appreciate your uh, your partnership with us. Uh, remember, two weeks finding more birds. Uh, sign up on uh, the website to get the Zoom link. And uh, with that, have a good evening. Thanks. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. All right.